show today, we're super excited to welcome Lieutenant Governor. Today we're excited. <laughs> I got so excited about the word that I messed it up. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. So today we're excited to welcome Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib. He is an American politician, lawyer, and professor, and he also... He is an American politician, lawyer, and professor, and is the 16th and current lieutenant governor of Washington, Washington State, that is. Welcome to Jesuitical. The real Washington. Thank <laughs> you so much. The real Washington. Good to be here with you. So, just to be clear, how should we re- address you during this interview? Lieutenant governor or- I would love it if you called me Cyrus. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, we'll address you. Lieutenant governor is just a lot of syllables. <laughs> yeah, and you can't like- Do you ever like, go by LG? Yeah, people sometimes, people will be like LG. Yeah, I like the, LG. Like, cool. in, it's, cool but it's more like in it. the yeah. third person, they might say, the LG was <laughs> here. That's uh, cool. It's a LG. To so, your face. So <laughs> next week we can talk about how yeah. LG is. Remember back when the LG was was gave such a great interview? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So so what what does a uh, lieutenant governor do in the state of Washington? We know we know it's a little different in every state, but what do you do, Cyrus? Yeah, it's different in every state. So um, in 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 our state, in Washington, the lieutenant governor is president of the Senate. So kind of the the equivalent or the the analog to the Speaker of the House. Um, the difference is that the speaker is chosen by House members, um, and so tends to be of the majority. Was is unless something's gone very oddly, will be of the majority party, uh, and therefore has a lot of uh, kind of political power in, in terms of deciding which bills get voted on, etc. In the Senate, the president is chosen in the general election for lieutenant governor. So uh, last year, for example, I was. Um, uh, president of the Senate as a Democrat when the Republicans were in the majority. This year, the Democrats took the majority in the Senate. Either way, I'm still the president. Um, so it's a mm-hmm. little bit of a different role than than the Speaker. But I, I, I run the chamber. I call on senators. Um, and I do play a role in deciding which measures get voted on as well. Then I, I fill in for the governor whenever he leaves the state. Uh, so for most governors, that's about 60 to 70 days a year. Because oh, wow. even if he leaves for like, – even if he goes over to Portland – uh, which is just across for those who, you know, don't know, just across the border <laughs> those from the Washington, Washington D.C. State. bubble. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So it's it's so even if he goes, you know, for for half an hour, uh, I'm the governor during that time, uh, and then I also run my own uh, small agency, the Office of the Lieutenant Governor, and we focus on uh, a few different things, in- including um, access to higher education. Uh, international trade and economic development and disability and veteran uh, uh, issues. Have any like crises happened while you were acting governor? No, and I'd, I'd like to just take a moment to recognize that, that uh, w- during every time I've been lieutenant, go- I've been acting governor, nothing has ever gone wrong yes. uh, That's right. in the state of Washington. So, so oh, great yeah, record. On great that. record on that. Undefeated. Um, but it does happen. I mean, for my predecessor was acting governor when um, we had a, a terrific uh, 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 kind of uh, terrible mudslide um, that uh, the, the, the president called a state of emergency um, and sent in um, f- you know, FEMA folks. I mean, it was a, it was a big deal. And I, I can't remember where the governor was at the time, but the lieutenant governor had to basically manage the whole situation. So, mm-hmm. so we do get trained and, and uh, are prepared to do that. Yeah. And so can you tell us a little bit about your journey to getting to be the lieutenant governor? You've you're you've done a lot in your in your three decades. <laughs> well, you know, yes, I, how old are you? You're only I'm 36. OK. Yeah. All right. I'm 36. And you've been like every uh, kind of scholar there can yeah. be. Rhodes Scholar, Truman Scholar. I've spent I <laughs> have, scholar. I have, um, you know, I, I was pretty uncertain about what I wanted to do when I when I grew up and I still am figuring it out. Uh, but. I knew, so I went through a period where I wanted to be an English professor, um, and so I studied uh, English literature. I, I w- went and got a graduate degree um, in post-colonial English literature. Uh, I then decided, with a little bit of prodding from my parents, um, that maybe I should take all that love of writing and reading and um, and kind of convert it or leverage it into a professional degree. So I went to law school, um, and, and I became really passionate about um, representing those whose voices hadn't been heard. Um, I did a good amount of that in, in, in law school. Um, I went to a private law firm, but I, I got to do a lot of pro bono work. Um, and then as I did that, and I, especially after President Obama was elected, and I, I kind of got it in my head that maybe someone with a Middle Eastern sounding name might actually be electable, <laughs> um, I uh, decided when there was a vacancy in the state House of Representatives, I decided to, to run for it. And, yeah. you know, w- there were a couple of things. One is that I, 
uh, you know, people with disabilities, uh, so your, your listeners may not know um, yet, but I, I became blind when I was eight years old due to childhood cancer. Um, and uh, I, I often joke that because that was in 1989, it does mean that all eight years I could see. All eight of those years took place in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. So all my visual memories are still from the 80s. So everyone still looks <laughs> yeah. like Cindy Lauper and Boy George. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty fantastic. crazy. Yeah. Is there a decade you'd rather have your memories from? Like looking back? No, I think the 80s. Uh, look, I think the 80s, if you're going to have kind of um, visual memories that will last a lifetime, mm-hmm. uh, I think the 80s are kind of nice, big, and sensational. That's Very true. evocative. That's yeah. true. Um, That's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, like, like I remember going into like a restaurant with my parents as a kid um, in Maryland, and there were like electric stars. Nice. Um, so yeah, that's that's something to keep with you. <laughs> um, so so I so I grew up with a disability, and and as a result, um, you know, my life outcomes could have been very different um, if my public schools had not been well funded, um, if my parents hadn't taught me to and and advocated for me and taught me to advocate for myself and if it weren't for state services that I received so as I kind of grew up and grew older I realized there's so many people that rely on these services and rely on our public schools and and who's I mean you know there's you know obviously there's there's uh, every year just in my state 1.1 million uh, kids in the public school system Um, a good percentage of them have some kind of disability uh, and so I wanted to run for the legislature to work on those issues and to maybe bring a kind of a different perspective to the legislature, not, not just someone who cares about these things, but someone who's actually been a recipient of those services. And would you say there's a, a discrepancy between the number of people with disabilities in the legislature versus the number of constituents with disabilities? Oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's massive. I mean, I, I, I uh, you know... I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of legislators out of 147 in Washington who self-identify as having a disability. Um, and uh, yeah, like there, there's, there's, you know, there's one legislator who has hearing loss in one year. Um, you know, so I'm not minimizing any of that, but, but there are not, uh, given that, you know, there are over 50 million Americans uh, with a disability. Uh, it's, I think it will be, uh, of probably of all minority groups, it will probably be the one that is underrepresented the longest, yeah. uh, because there is a mix of, you know, uh, you know, with with a lot of other discrimination, um, it's it's basically just perception, right? It's just it's just bigotry, uh, a lack of education. With disability, there are actual um, costs to a commitment to inclusion. So for example, uh, as Lieutenant Governor, I, I, I mentioned that I serve as President of the Senate, so I call on senators to speak. Uh, well, how do I know which one wants to be recognized? Uh, other than the fact that politicians basically always want to speak. Um, <laughs> you know, so the way it would normally happen is a senator stands up and the, the Lieutenant Governor would see them and, and call on them. Um, well, that obviously wasn't gonna work, and so we thought about, well, should we have like a staffer just, you know, sit up there and just like whisper the name of every person. It, it just seems so wasteful of a human being's mm-hmm. time and labor, right? Mm-hmm. So we created a system where there's a touch screen on every senator's desk. And when they want to speak, they stand and press this, uh, you know, this button on their screen that says request to speak. It sends their name up to a computer where I'm standing at the front of the chamber, and it is presented on a Braille display in real time. Mm. So I can see, you know, I can feel in Braille, you know, Senator so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so, and then I can call on them in the order that makes sense for the debate. But that costs money to install. Mm-hmm. And so what would a world look like, what would a public education system look like if we treated every kid like they were the president of their own Senate, right, mm-hmm. in their classroom? Yeah, so that's a concrete change that you were able to bring get, because of your life experience. Um, uh, to the Senate, is there is there something a piece of legislation or a change you've made um, either in the schools in Washington or uh, that tried to like give yeah. those benefits to other yeah so other in people? the right so in the in the arena of um, of of kind of disability rights mm-hmm. and um, and equity, 
one of the things that was made known to me and which kind of resonated in my own personal life was that, um, you know, you have to qualify for disability accommodations when you go to um, uh, college. And uh, so what was happening, though, was that you had students who would go to a community college and then transfer. They'd want to transfer to a university. Um, and they'd have to go back and do all the qualifications all over again, right, to go to a doctor, to maybe get tested, to do all these things um, just to continue studying. Uh, and, you know, you know, it seems like a small barrier, but already, uh, you know, people with disabilities are facing so many challenges, you know, even just getting the, their transit figured out to get to school, um, that it really didn't seem to make any sense. Like, like I'm not going to be any less blind in September right. um, <laughs> when I transfer to the University of Washington than in June when I'm at, you know, uh, Everett Community College. So, uh, so we said, let's change that. And, and of course, you know, it's tough to do even small things when they're institutional players. Um, so we, we began a process and, and uh, instructed all of these institutions to create one universal common system for all of these kids. So, so there's kind of targeted things like that. On a higher level, I would say where my experience has informed the work I'm doing um, is around the work we're doing on higher education. Um, and I know this will be near and dear to your uh, lay, but, you know, work with Jesuit hearts, um, <laughs> is that, um, you know, there's a, there's a sentence that I hear a lot from politicians in both parties. Uh, and that sentence is, quote, college isn't for everyone. Um, and you hear it, and it's not said, you know, with malice. Um, it's said with oftentimes a lot of compassion. Uh, but when you ask that person whether they themselves went to college, you know, it turns out that they did. Uh, and then when you ask them what they do for a living, it turns out they do something that requires a college degree. And then when you ask what their kids are doing, what their plan is for their kids, they're also sending their kids to college or plan to. So it's, so then it's like, who are you talking about, right? Who are these people for whom college isn't necessarily for? Um, and I think we know that that could have been me. Um, you know, it's kids in who may be from communities of color uh, or, or rural white areas or tribal country or uh, kids with disabilities. Um, and so we are really working hard in my office to try to turn that theory on its head and to say, let's give every kid the belief in themselves and the preparation and the access to go to college and then, you know what, if they're sitting there, they've got college admissions letters, you know, acceptance letters and the money to pay for it. And, and then they decide, I don't want to go to college. More power to them. You know what I mean? Then they're making right. a decision from a place of strength. Um, but, you know, it, it always baffles me when people say, you know, I talked to this 15-year-old kid and she just doesn't think college is for her. She just doesn't want to go down. I'm like, well, you know what? For she didn't. She wasn't born that way, right? That yeah. kid has had 15 years of the world telling her what she's good for. Yep. So, um, not to mention you know. all the you know everyone ha has figured out what they want or should or should not do at 15. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Exactly. Then I'm really in trouble because here I am, 21 years later, still under it. So, uh, so speaking of sort of like resistance, w w have you encountered resistance in the legislature to uh, these types of? initiatives and programs that you want to put forward or even to implementing a system that uh, costs money where you can, you know, know which uh, senators want to speak and whatnot. Yeah, I, I would say, um, so I, I tend to, to group um, political pushback into three categories. Um, one is um, we agree on the problem, we agree on the solution, but not on its relative level of priority, right? Right. So that's where money becomes an issue because you're like, yeah, yeah, like, like ideally we would give every kid free preschool. Like we all agree that that would be a good thing to do, um, but we've got to do this other thing over here, right? And so I think there are legitimate debates to be had, right? Because there's finite amount of money and, and we've got lots of problems. The second category is we agree on the problem, but we disagree on the solution. Um, and those are ones, you know, that's where you often find like partisanship tends to, um, you know, kind of rear its head around those sorts of things, right, where, you know, Democrats and Republicans may both agree that we need to grow jobs uh, or that, like, you know, North Korea is a threat, but there's just different 
solutions um, that people feel very strongly. And then the worst situation is where like you don't even agree that this is a problem, mm-hmm. right? Th- those are the most bitter um, fights. And you know sometimes, unfortunately, with this issue of colleges and for everyone, um, it does sometimes fall in that category because there's actually people who think that it is elitist um, and and wrong headed and actually cruel to young people to force them into thinking that college is something that they ought to do such that they would think of themselves as failures if they didn't go. Um, and so what I've really tried to do, um, because I, I started out, like being a lawyer, I started out wanting to argue about this all the time with people. Um, and I sometimes w- still will do that, but then I realized, you know what? There's a lot of room for us to work together. So you might think that an apprenticeship is a better um, is a better model than, than a traditional college. And I don't need to prove you wrong for us to figure out a way for kids or for anyone to get college credit when doing an apprenticeship. Because then we both win, right? Then like you're giving, you know, you're kind of elevating um, the, the trades um, and, and opening pathways that are non-conventional and aren't the kind of ivy covered, you know, quadrangle reading Aristotle. Um, but then I also am, am, I feel satisfied that if that job is made obsolete because of technology or trade, uh, or the person gets an injury or something like that, that, you know, they'll have a pathway to a college degree, Mm -hmm. um, and be able to be resilient in the economy. And, um, so I'm challenging myself to try to find more ways to, when there is pushback to, to kind of, um, to kind of work within the ideology of, of the of the of, of my interlocutor. So would you say, Cyrus, that your faith has a lot to do with that? With you, you're very passionate about the work that you do. But do you think the ability to kind of meet people instead of just running away from this pushback has a lot to do with your faith? And how does I, it, it? How does your faith overall just sustain you in the? Work I think that you wanting do? to do that. I think you have to first. You have to want to do it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean. So I think that definitely comes. Um, from from my Catholic faith, and and I would say, increasingly, um, thanks to Father Martin and and others, uh, from the kind of the the Ignatian influence of of discernment, and uh, and even the process of praying the examine and thinking through, you know, were there opportunities that I missed? What was that person really saying when we had that conversation? Were they actually was there a way that that could have gone differently? Um, so I definitely think that that almost on a meta level um, is is helpful because, you know, you get so passionate about the things that you're working on that sometimes you actually enjoy the conflict. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it can be and it can feel really satisfying to score points. Yeah. It sounds um, like you're yeah. saying Ignatian spirituality could be like the way we solve political polarization in this country. <laughs> I think it's a I think it would be I, I think it could be a huge part of the solution. Yeah. I think and whether it's whether it's the, the spiritual exercises or other traditions for other folks. Um, yeah. just the, the being contemplative, being reflective, thinking about um, how did that encounter go? Yeah, uh, Pope Francis has said that politics is a noble activity, which I think for a lot of people who maybe aren't looking at state politics but are looking at what's coming out of Washington can kind of be a surprising thing to hear. Um, could could you talk a little bit about like what how how state or local politics um, differs from like the kind of toxic partisanship we see on the national stage and like maybe some lessons we could gain from that. Yeah, it it's better. I don't know that I would say it's so much better that yeah. it is a um a model um because we definitely have um toxicity in um in state government as well. Um I think there are some forcing functions in state government um for example, all but one state have a balanced budget requirement. Um, I don't think that would work at the federal level, but I think the that forcing function means that, like, you know, legislators ultimately need to reach deals. Um, I think having a shorter session 
uh, you know, so most legislatures are not full time. They're not full, you know, year round. Um, I think means that you get people who are not, um, at least at that point, uh, only career politicians. Um, and I think that, ironically, um, and I don't. I want to be very careful because I'm not. I, I don't oppose um, transparency into the federal government. Um, like I, I, I think C-SPAN does amazing work. I think all, we need much better and more reporting. And you guys do some of that reporting and others. But you know, at the federal level, because it's so high profile, particularly the Senate, right? Where you know they're almost celebrities in in some ways. Um, you know, there's there's such an incentive to. Um, to uh, be the to posture and to be the yeah I'm being very yeah. careful right <laughs> you know but to or be, like to, play a character right like you are you have a brand and you've got to stick exactly to it. Yeah. exactly so you know like Senator Warren she has her brand Senator Sanders has his brand um, you know and and the system kind of incentivizes that um, right now um, and it doesn't mean that those people don't have legitimate uh, policies or ideas um, but uh, you know. I think what you find as you get to lower levels of government is um, people who basically do the work, not expecting to have, you know, 5,000 retweets because they had some really <laughs> clever, you know, uh, you know, line on Trump, right, for the day. Do you think so. there's something the media could do better to, like, disincentivize that? Or what? To, what's a good type of transparency that the media can work towards? I think doing profiles on senators and, and representatives and, and other elected officials at different levels who are doing really good work. Um, you know, uh, for example, b both of our senators, uh, Patty Murray and Maria Cantwell um, in Washington State, I think are, are workhorses. You know, they're not show horses. Um, I mean, Patty Murray brokered with Paul Ryan um, the, the, the most kind of significant bipartisan budget deal of the decade. She brokered with Lamar Alexander a big education bill, bipartisan education reform bill um, that both sides um, could be proud of. You know, but people don't know Patty Murray that well nationally, right? And there's a reason, because she's working so hard um, and she's not running for president. Um, and so I, I think the more we can do profiles of, of, of those folks, because um, what you see already now, right, is profile. I mean, you guys, I'm sure, are seeing this, profiles of potential presidential nominees. Right, yeah. right. That's it's the already been happening. To right. Yeah. right, it's already been happening, and we're two and a half years away from that election. So, do so. you do you have any models as far as politicians who you think do a good job of integrating their faith in public life? Joe Biden. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I was why. just <laughs> talking with Father Malone about that earlier. I mean, he's just so real. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just so real. He's um, he is he is an imperfect human being. Mm -hmm. He's a flawed human being. We all are, right? Mm -hmm. But he th he acknowledges it, and even kind of with humor, will acknowledge. Um, you know, not always with humor, but when it's appropriate with humor, sometimes with remorse, um, his shortcomings. But he just is so present and real um, with constituents which you know for eight years meant all of us mm -hmm. um and um and i and i think that's what allows him to speak to americans across racial uh and and gender lines and and so many other different um you know dividing lines earlier you said uh that ignatian spirituality has helped you as a politician sort of you know be a real person uh Re recently, we were looking back at uh, a Jesuit chaplain fired from uh, yeah. the House of Representatives. And some people raise questions about why there's a chaplain even there in the first place. Uh, do you have a perspective on that? Should should there be more chaplains? Yeah, chaplains? I've, got a, I've got a kind of an interesting perspective because my office uh, coordinates uh, who provides the, the prayer in the state Senate. Um, mm. And uh, we... Uh, you know, we work hard uh, and we, we get input, you know, it's um, and suggestions. But, we you know, we work hard to have diversity, um, you know, which and I think it's important to recognize um, about this story is that it's not like the chaplain gives the prayer himself every day. Right. Like he's court. He brought he brings in other people. In fact, I think if I'm not mistaken, that there was some one of the issues here was that he'd brought in. 
uh, a Muslim cleric. Um, yeah. right. right. So so I think people sometimes think like, well, why should a Catholic give a prayer every single day of the, you know? Um, so 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 for us, um, look, the work that happens in government, uh, if it's not related to our core beliefs, then it's not important work. Right. The things that you pray about um, in, you know, in your in your petitionary prayers, right, your own health, the health of your parents or your kids or your loved ones, um, good outcomes on a test or in a, in a admissions process for college or something like that. Um, you know, maybe even a prayer for don't let me be late for my Jesuitical interview. <laughs> let, let, let this traffic start moving. All of those things are matters of public policy. Hmm. Right. Like there's there's basically right. There's like almost nothing. Transit health. Pub- yeah. Right. Yeah. There's almost yeah. nothing that in like petitionary prayer. Um, you know, you bring before God that that government can't also do something about. Yeah. And then right? for Catholics, we call, call that like matters of the common good, which it seems right. like that's kind of like not that salient in politics right now. Like, how how do we restore this this like common the like a commitment to the common good? Yeah, I mean, I think I think almost everybody has it, uh, but I I you know again I go back to this this that kind of trifold. Um, analysis of like there's just different differences of opinion sometimes around priority around solutions sometimes around whether it's a problem and I think that's maybe to your question that's the most troubling right is how do we get everyone to agree that homelessness is an emergency Um, how do we get everyone to agree that climate change um, is a is an emergency for our planet and our people Um, those can be really frustrating Um, you know but but I guess on the issue of, of chaplaincy, and I, I, I would just say what's important is th- you, you can never, so my, I guess my point is you can never depoliticize it um, altogether. You wouldn't want someone to get up there and pray and say, you know, um, God, we come before you today hoping the Republicans will see the light on climate change or hoping the <laughs> Democrats will see the light on reproductive health care, right? Like that's not, that would not be appropriate. I think. Right. But but raising issues of the common good, to your point, um, that we are all praying about privately, airing that publicly, bringing the collective, um, you know, power of prayer of all the people in the chamber to bear on that, to come before God, um, I think is a powerful thing. Mm, Yeah. Great. Um, so we've got, thanks for that, Sarius. Right. Um, uh, one final question for you. Um, if you could canonize anyone, living or dead, Catholic or non-Catholic, who would it be and why? I'm ready for this. Uh, <laughs> as a listener, as an avid listener. That, um, we love to hear that, yeah. by the way. Yeah, that so many of our guests are just this. like always stumped when we ask yeah. that question. Yeah. Uh, so we're excited. Go ahead. Um, Desmond Tutu. Oh, I'm, I'm okay. going, I'm going... I'm going with an Anglican, okay. um, <laughs> but it's going to be okay because when when the Anglicans come into full communion with Rome, that's right. People yeah. um, have uh, baptized will... Cleopatra, so I uh, think we're on safe ground yeah. with Desmond Tutu. <laughs> yeah, although, but maybe not. I mean, maybe it's more controversial for right. some people. Might be. I mean, I think there are elements of of um, of his positions that mm-hmm. I, I'm sure would be controversial. Uh, I know are controversial with some Catholics um, because there was an there was a. Uh, an incident where uh, he was invited to, sp- to speak at Gonzaga, um, and there were Catholics who uh, agitated mm. against that uh, because of some of his views. Uh, but but you, you think they're wrong because well no <laughs> but I but 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 to my mind um, when I think about a person living r- right now uh, who had such a powerful effect on a country. Um, a, even a continent, um, the and the world through advocating nonviolence, um, and just has lived a grace-filled and faith-based life, and managed to navigate politically difficult situations, including uh, life-threatening ones, but done it in a way that elevates God. Um, I think uh, Desmond Tutu is prime ready for uh, canonization. All awesome. Right. All right. Saint, Saint Desmond Tutu. Tutu. Saint Tutu. <laughs> right. Saint awesome. Tutu better. <laughs> Awesome. All right, Cyrus, thank you so much for coming on the show. This means a lot. And where can people learn more about uh, your work or perhaps maybe some Washington state wines (laughs) that you provided us with? Yeah, I was glad. Yeah, where was the plug? Yes, Uh, it's right right here. here. It's right here. (laughs) So Cyrus brought us a gift. Uh, 
wine from the state of Washington, which I was surprised to learn that the second most second largest wine producing state in the country. Yeah, and we are we're drinking Best substance. Yeah. Yes, I Cabernet. love the name. <laughs> yes, um, and uh, but yeah, I'm I'm on Facebook and Twitter um, at Cyrus Abib, and my official account, which has kind of. Um, less snarky uh, but more lieutenant gubernatorial content is at <laughs> WALTG. Okay, so that's your double life. That's, that's right. Okay. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, thank you so much, us. Cyrus. Thanks, guys. It was perfect. I was Wait, I made a mistake. Let's do the whole thing all over again. <laughs> start over. Yeah. yeah. I want to change my saying. Let's start from the beginning. <laughs>